information on the faculty governance page about how to get to the YouTube. You simply click on the agenda that leads you to YouTube. And if you have questions at any point during the meeting, if you are a member of the council, you can use the chat function. If you are not a member of the council, you will need to use the directions that appear on the stream information below the video. It tells you how to send a text, which will then be uh, a question for the speaker. So I want to thank all of you for being here. And I also want to thank the, the leaders of the faculty governance uh, office. And they have done an amazing job in putting this meeting together and the technology. Uh, this includes Helena Canego and Lisa Jean McKenzie and Khadija Murray and the faculty secretary, Vin Stepanidis. They've worked incredibly hard to organize this meeting and to set up the technology. And if we have problems, it's not because there hasn't been careful preparation, but I'm very optimistic that we'll be able to communicate efficiently throughout this meeting. And I also thank Emily Blackburn, who is managing the questions that will be coming in through the live stream. I said uh, last month that there has never been a faculty council meeting in an almost empty room, but now I can say that we're carrying this social isolation to a higher level. I feel confident in saying there's never been a faculty meeting in which everybody is in their own room somewhere scattered around Chapel Hill or beyond, and there's not a single person in the same room. So we're all living in this kind of Zoom land universe now, and it can wear us down but we're gonna to try to make this an effective meeting and a real conversation. As people in every community and organization are now saying, we are living truly in uncharted waters and we're all struggling <laughs> to balance our professional and personal lives in a kind of precarious balance uh, as we float in our little houseboats on these choppy waters. I think as scholars and teachers, we like to think that we can understand and explain many different aspects of the natural world and the social world, but I'm sure that when we convened our first faculty council meeting this year, back in September, not a single person in the room believed that in April we would be having a Zoom meeting and none of us would be in the same room. So we're mostly dispersed now in our own places and yet Strangely, this dispersion has brought us into a shared experience. We're all sharing something, which is the experience of isolation. And our undergraduate and graduate students are... Oops. It, it is also, excuse me, I was muted. Um, but I wanna stress that we're all sharing the same experience, but it's also the experience of our students, our staff, and the students at all levels, we're all experiencing the problem of vulnerability, even as we try to respond creatively to the situation. And I wanna thank everybody for the incredible work that they're doing. This includes the faculty and the staff, the students, undergraduates and graduate students alike. I've been particularly concerned in recent weeks about graduate students who are losing summer research funding, losing travel grants and job opportunities. Uh, but this pandemic is affecting students at every level, but it's a particular professional crisis for graduate students, as some explained in a list of concerns and demands they released during this past week. There's also been a very clear summary of concerns and a collective statement from the Senate of the Graduate and Professional Student Federation, to which the chancellor and the provost and the dean of the graduate school have responded. So I want to emphasize that the faculty also share the concerns of the Graduate Student Association, and I appreciate their concerns. So at today's meeting, we're gonna hear from the provost and the chancellor about the university's evolving response to the COVID-19 crisis. But, but we'll also uh, be discussing um, some of the specific issues that are still on the agenda including a report of the task force on promotion and tenure by Ron Strauss, the leader of that task force. And this is a proposal to create more flexibility in the ways we evaluate our colleagues for tenure and promotion. And we'll hear from the chair of that committee, Steve Cruz, the Committee on, of, the committee on Appointments, Promotion and Tenure, 
who will provide some perspectives on the committee's recommendations about these recommendations. But before we turn to the future, I want to stress that faculty governance has played an essential role throughout this year in addressing issues that arose even before the uh, pandemic arrived. And I just want to remind you very briefly of what we have dealt with over the past eight or nine months. These issues include controversial and complex issues such as the creation of the program on public discourse. The Board of Governors now rescinded agreement to give Silent Sam and 2.5 million to the Sons of the Confederate Veterans. The AAU report on sexual misconduct, the challenge of budget uncertainties and salary inequities, as well as the problem of faculty, uh, fixed term faculty concerns about campus safety, the difficult engagement with our university's historical entanglement with slavery and racism and discrimination, and attitudes about free speech and diversity. But at the same time, the council has also engaged with many positive things looking toward the future, including the work of our task group on historical reckoning, the innovative proposals for a new data uh, science program, the implementation of our strategic plan, Carolina Next, the rollout of the future general education curriculum for undergraduates, and the ongoing success of our ambitious fundraising campaign. And I mentioned these issues because they raise new challenges as well as new opportunities. But my main point in making these, this list of issues is to remind us that faculty have to be involved in the analysis and policy making that accompany all important problems, controversies, and institutional changes. And faculty will need to be deeply involved with the processes that will shape the transitions as we move back to classroom instruction and to campus research, as well as ongoing refinements with the online teaching. And the institutional structure for these issues will come through faculty governance. As I welcome our next chair of the faculty, Mimi Chapman, who will speak to us soon, I want to emphasize to all our faculty colleagues that she will depend, as I have, on the amazing work of people throughout every part of this very strong university. I also want to stress <clears throat> that we are especially fortunate in having university leaders who have wide experience as faculty members themselves. And I particularly thank Kevin Guskowitz, Bob Bluen, and the deans of all our schools for their remarkable work in responding creatively to the COVID-19 crisis and in working with me and other leaders of the faculty throughout this academic year. They will continue to face major challenges but I know that they intend to work constantly with the faculty, staff, and students as we go forward into the still unknown territory of declining economic resources, changing instructional patterns, and continuing uncertainties about all of our activities as we're trying to figure out how to reorganize our professional lives. We have to be a collaborative team. So as we move into the issues on today's agenda, I want simply to say that it has been a great honor for me to serve this year as chair of the faculty council. I have learned from so many people and gained new insights into the incredible talents of the people who work and study <clears throat> at UNC. And I've also developed an appreciation for the people who held leadership positions at UNC in the past. And I've thought of myself this year as one of the baton carriers in the university's great relay race toward the future. Our predecessors have given the UNC baton to our generation, and we're going to pass this baton to others who will build on the work that we're doing today, including our work during the pandemic. And in a moment, we're going to honor colleagues who have died over this past year and we'll recognize them as some of the people who have given us the institutional baton that we'll pass on to others. But I wanna conclude my own remarks today by quoting the wisdom of a wise philosopher. 
I think you've seen over the year that I like to turn to humanistic traditions and writers to make sense of our current situations. And last month I turned to Boccaccio and to Albert Camus because I found their perspectives extremely helpful. But today I want to quote the Stoic thinker Epictetus who lived in the Roman Empire from about 55 to 135 of the Common Era. And Epictetus had been born into slavery. And though he eventually gained his freedom and became a teacher, he knew about all the adversities of the human condition, from physical limitations to the numerous obstacles that block people from achieving their goals or ambitions. And his perspective on how to give a, live a good life is worth quoting briefly as we move forward with our own struggles in 2020. What really frightens and dismays us, Epictetus explained, is not external events themselves, but the way in which we think about them. It is not external things that disturb us, but our interpretation of their significance. The greater the difficulty, the more glory we have in surmounting it. Skillful pilots gain their reputation from storms and tempests, make the best of what is in our power and take the rest as it occurs. So as we come to the end of this academic year, I hope that we may all be skillful pilots as we sail through this great COVID tempest. And now I would like to ask for a moment of silence in our Zoom bound homes as we recognize those colleagues who have died over this past year. Elena, we can start the list. So the deceased colleagues we've recognized serve the university in different ways. And I thank and honor each of them again for their great work over many years. But now I wanna to turn to the future. And I wanna thank all of our colleagues who were candidates for faculty committees and faculty council in the faculty elections that took place over this past week through online voting. 
In contrast to some places in the United States, we have no concerns about voting by mail. But this is again the work of our great faculty governance staff to organize this kind of event. As I noted earlier, every aspect of shared governance is important for the vitality and well being of the university. And faculty governance can only survive and flourish because people are willing to serve in these offices. Although there are always candidates who lose as well as candidates who win, everyone's participation in this process as a candidate and or as a voter has been essential to the electoral process. And the willingness of hundreds of colleagues to communicate their interest in a possible nomination for a committee election is equally important. I thank all of you for your participation. And I also thank the roughly 20 faculty council members who are completing their terms at this meeting. Thanks to all of you. If we were in the room, I would ask you each to stand up and we would cheer for you. Thank you. This year in the election just completed, we had 1,778 faculty voters, which is roughly 48% of the voting faculty. There were 117 faculty members running for 61 uh, positions, including 72 candidates for 38 committee positions and 43 candidates for 22 open faculty council seats, plus two candidates for the faculty, chair of the faculty. And we also had 86 retired faculty who voted for a retired faculty representative. The results of this election have been posted on the faculty governance website. So I encourage you to go there to see the results. But I particularly want to thank our colleague Joy Renner for her candidacy for the position of chair of the faculty. Joy is extremely talented and experienced in faculty governance work, and she will continue to serve all of us through her service on the faculty executive committee. But now it is my great pleasure to congratulate Mimi Chapman, a professor in the School of Social Work, who has been elected to a three-year term as chair of the faculty and I would like to ask her to make a few comments to the council now and to welcome her to this event. Mimi? Hi, I, I'm hoping that everyone can hear me. Um, as fate would have it, our internet at home went down just before this meeting. So I'm sorry to only be joining you um, by landline. I'm extremely just delighted and honored and humbled to have been elected to represent all of you. As I've said before, the UNC faculty is just an amazing group of people with so many talents and so much, uh, so much to offer the world at this particular moment, as in, in, in every moment of crisis. I do want to mention Joy and I have talked and we will be working together. I know that I will seek her counsel as well as the counsel of many of you as I learn this new role. And uh, one of my favorite sort of sayings is from a Chilean author that says we make the road by walking. And I think right now that is probably more apropos than even in normal difficult times. Um, in order to, un because we don't know what's in front of us. We don't know exactly how things are going to unfold, how our budget's going to unfold, how students are going to respond to new learning situations, how long we're going to have to be in this virtual world. So we will have to pull together as best we can and communicate well as best we can across um, new platforms. And I will do my very best. So I am open to your feedback and comments, happy to talk with anyone by uh, phone or by Zoom individually or in small groups. And I'm looking forward to getting to know even more of you and to, to making this new road together. Thank you very much, Mimi. I think you're going to do a great job. You're coming into this role in a particularly challenging time, but I know your experience and your perspectives are gonna be valuable to all of us. And I thank you again for your willingness to serve. So thank I wanna turn now point. to the next item on the agenda, 
which is an update from Chancellor Kevin Guskowitz. And uh, I want to thank him again for all he's doing. And Kevin, we'll let you take it away. <laughs> Great. Looks like Thanks. you're still in your office. So that's very reassuring to all of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Lloyd. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Well, Lloyd, I want to thank, start off by just thanking you for your uh, dedicated, uh, passionate, and, and strong leadership uh, in, in uh, chairing the faculty here at Carolina. Uh, I have thoroughly enjoyed working alongside you uh, over the past year, and I want to congratulate uh, Mimi uh, on, uh, on her election, and I'm looking forward to uh, spending uh, more time with you, uh, Mimi, and, uh, and working closely together on all the issues uh, in front of us. And uh, I want to thank all of those who ran for faculty council and, and uh, for your participation, all those that voted um, and participated, uh, really appreciate that and looking forward to working alongside all those who have been elected uh, to the various committees for next year. I uh, want to uh, uh, just offer my thoughts and prayers uh, to those who've been impacted by COVID-19. Uh, it's uh, every day I learn of more people who are affected in, in very different ways by uh, the pandemic. And so our thoughts and prayers go out uh, to all of you. Uh, I'm extremely proud, as I uh, said to the faculty executive committee on Monday, uh, at the way our universities responded to this. Uh, just before I jumped on this call, because we've been talking uh, a lot about the role that our uh, health affairs and, and School of Medicine and, and uh, UNC hospitals, uh, faculty and nurses and doctors and researchers have played in helping to uh, take on this virus, uh, but we're, we're doing it in other ways. Uh, just before the meeting, I uh, received word from Doug Shackelford that uh, several of his faculty are working with uh, state government and the governor's office and helping to think about the ways in which the, uh, the economy, uh, advising them in terms of uh, the way the economy should uh, be uh, restarted in North Carolina when, when it's determined safe to do that. And so we're bringing so much expertise. I know faculty in our Department of Economics are also involved in those discussions. And so uh, there are a lot of different ways in which um, uh, Capitol Hill is contributing. Uh, we are finishing, as you well know, week four of remote classes, and I've enjoyed uh, stopping into several classes over the past two weeks and uh, visiting with students and faculty. And thanks to those of you that have uh, invited me to uh, to jump in and, uh, uh, and and visit your classes. It's uh, been incredible to see how we've made this pivot in such a short period of time. And uh, the uh, the students, for the most part, seem to be uh, adapting well, as, as are our faculty. Uh, I've, um, uh, you know, as you have, I hope, seen increased communication to our campus. Uh, we're uh, checking in often with uh, students and, and faculty, probably more than ever, just to see how everybody's doing. Uh, we've heard that uh, people are liking the video communications uh, on a weekly basis. And uh, yes, some of those, Lloyd, as you pointed out, are, are here from campus where uh, I am, uh, Bob Lewin and I are still spending a, a significant amount of time here uh, on campus. Uh, I, I wish that uh, all of you could be back here, but uh, we still have about 650 students living in our residence halls and uh, hundreds of hospital workers, as you well know, and, uh, and many researchers who are still uh, able to access their research labs because of the uh, important uh, and groundbreaking work that they're uh, involved with that's helping to take on the virus. Uh, I just enjoyed, uh, to, you know, sadly, this is senior week. Uh, and and the sad part there is that the seniors aren't here to be able to enjoy it. I just earlier today sent a video out on social media to the seniors and we're missing them here. Uh, this week that they would have been doing the bell tower climb and uh, the supper at Sutton's and all those fun events that take place in senior week. But we're going to uh, certainly find a way to celebrate their accomplishments when we have, uh, when we're able to safely hold a commencement here, which uh, I'm still hopeful that we're going to be able to do this coming fall. Uh, we also sent a survey out to students on campus, uh, had about over 10,000 responses so far, uh, working and we're working through the data now just to see how students are adapting. What are the biggest challenges that they're faced with? Uh, the majority of the questions that we're hearing from students and challenges that they seem to be faced with uh, are related to uh, finances and plans for the summer and the fall. Uh, we've heard a bit about um, some of the challenges with uh, taking exams remotely, and I know that uh, our IT uh, teams and those uh, in our uh, various in the dean's offices are trying to work closely with uh, faculty and students to try to overcome some of the challenges with uh, taking exams remotely. But uh, I appreciate their con the concerns of the students and the uncertainty uh, can be very frustrating for all of us. And uh, I know that, uh, in, that our faculty are, are likewise frustrated. 
I, I do want you to know that I've assembled a working group uh, that will be considering uh, several options uh, for the fall, uh, while also utilizing the experience of our and expertise of our world class uh, and incredible infectious disease scholars here at Carolina. Uh, I'll be uh, seeking the input also of the Chancellor's Advisory Committee. I had a great conversation with uh, Suzanne Gulledge uh, yesterday, who chairs that committee. Uh, we want faculty's input as we're considering the options. And again, my hope is that we will uh, have a convocation uh, with about 4,500 new uh, students, first year students in Carmichael Arena on August the 16th, and that is uh, our goal. Uh, but we do need to have some contingency planning in place. And so uh, Provost Bluen and uh, David Ruth and uh, our uh, Jonathan Pruitt, our, our leadership team is uh, we're, we're looking closely at uh, all the options uh, uh, along with on, on the academic side, how we would uh, need to pivot perhaps to a different uh, academic calendar and we'll provide more updates uh, as that is available. Just want to again emphasize how grateful we are to the UNC hospital doctors, nurses and staff who are, are fighting the virus. Uh, uh, our research uh, researchers are incredible. We're, we're Terry Magnuson reported just last week that uh, we're we're actually up eight percent in research expenditures uh, from where we were last year at this time. And so, given what we've been through over the last five or six weeks, that's incredible. And I think many of you probably saw that uh, Microsoft Analytics, uh, Microsoft Academic Analytics, uh, ranked us number one in the U.S. Uh, among universities for the research in fighting the virus and uh, the CDC and the NIH were the only two institutions that were ahead of us. We were the first uh, university, but uh, our mission of research, service and teaching continues. And uh, I have uh, enjoyed meeting with uh, uh, leaders across campus, including our human resources uh, uh, leaders, uh, the board of trustees. We held a meeting this week uh, and the work of the university continues. And I've enjoyed uh, again, the, the various uh, faculty council uh, committee meetings that we've had to hold uh, via Zoom, but I feel as if we uh, continue to be productive moving forward. Uh, we are <clears throat> monitoring the state uh, budget situation and anticipate uh, that uh, it will impact uh, uh, the UNC system uh, with a shortfall, uh, uh, you know, that's it's likely to come to the state on the uh, reduced tax receipts, and this will likely have an impact on our campus. Uh, it's too early to know uh, the extent, but uh, we must recognize that practically every uh, form of campus revenue uh, is threatened by this pandemic uh, from tuition uh, and state appropriations, student housing and dining receipts for which we've already made significant refunds on or we're in the process of making those back to students uh, to ticket sales for athletics and our, our performing arts. So uh, we have to continue to think about the impact that this will have, uh, but the sooner that we can safely resume normal campus operations, uh, the more stable our financial situation will become. And uh, I can tell you that uh, every day we're uh, monitoring this, working on this, and uh, doing everything possible to mitigate uh, the, uh, a budget, what a budget shortfall might present to us. Uh, I have said repeatedly that we will prioritize our people, uh, our students, uh, our, our core mission, and uh, the uh, Carolina Next, uh, that strategic plan that Lloyd mentioned earlier, uh, will be our roadmap as we consider uh, how to address the uh, potential budget shortfall. Uh, Lloyd's mentioned graduate students, and uh, I, I, there, as I have said repeatedly, that uh, graduate students were uh, very important, critical to our mission here at Carolina. Uh, I received two very thoughtful letters from uh, the Graduate Professional Student uh, Federation leaders uh, this week. Uh, and so Bob Blue and Suzanne Barber and I did respond yesterday uh, to the uh, concerns and some of the requests that came from the group. And uh, we'll continue to dialogue and have conversations so that we can hear the, the concerns that they're having. Uh, I truly believe our community is stronger than ever. And I, I am so impressed by how people are working to build uh, that community even from afar. And my hope is that we, uh, as we think about uh, our re-entry uh, to a normal uh, campus situation, to normal campus operations, uh, whenever that may be, uh, that, that we will all take the opportunity to reimagine what the new normal can look like. Uh, I've always said that on the other side of every challenge are opportunities and it's our job. Uh, and I'm gonna rely on faculty uh, and faculty council to help us think about what those opportunities uh, might be. Uh, I, I think there's gonna be three types of universities that are going to emerge uh, from this pandemic. 
uh, you might call the first being the stubborn type, that being the type that's going to uh, try to quickly return to the status quo the way everything was uh, uh, back uh, on um, March the, the 10th before everything changed. And uh, the second type probably uh, of university be those that will try to change some things around the margins, maybe having learned a little bit from this, and uh, but probably will be quick to revert back. And the third type is probably the, 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 the one that uh, is going to recognize that change is here and that we can learn from what just occurred and become even stronger and better. Uh, and um, so I want to, uh, us to aspire to hopefully be that that third type of university that can learn with it from this. And I know Provost Bluen has been uh, talking with the deans on a regular basis and had a really healthy conversation just yesterday about what some of those opportunities might be uh, for, for our university. So, um, uh, you know, we're, we're participating in what I would call a sort of a forced experiment uh, and some uh, interesting results are already emerging. And uh, we went online in just about 10 days to two weeks, if you think about that back in mid-March. And uh, I think it reflects the uh, ingenuity of our faculty and our students. And so we want to continue to hear what's working well, what's not working well, uh, you know, answering questions about can we teach uh, students more effectively in their certain situations? Can we teach more students, perhaps? Is this an opportunity to think of a bit about how we would expand enrollment for certain groups, uh, certain program types? Uh, uh, can segments of our workforce be more efficient and cost effective through teleworking? Uh, we've, we've seen a, you know, the productivity, I will tell you, uh, that, that what I've been hearing is that it's been incredible the, the, the way our, our workforce has, has worked through this in terms of keeping up uh, the efficiency. So how do we remain uniquely Carolina is another question that we keep asking people. And so as I wrap up here and, and pass this off to, uh, uh, to Provost Blue, and I, I just want to say that I, I want to encourage all of us to to, to reimagine a creative and, and bold uh, new normal uh, together, uh, despite some of the challenges, as I've already indicated around uh, the possibility of budgetary constraints, but I think we can, can learn from this and become stronger. So again, I just wanna thank you, Lloyd, uh, for all that you've done. And um, I wanna pass uh, either back to you, Lloyd, or, or, or off to Bob uh, for his comments. Well, I think uh, we might start with a few questions to you and then come back to Bob. Sounds great. Okay. And um, Helena is going to inform you by calling on people with questions. Helena? Um, yes, Jan Honig has a question. Jan, you may um, go ahead and ask your question. Please be Hello. concise. Thank you. Hello, thank I'll you. I'll do for my best. Yeah. <laughs> I think I should I'm be answering going to questioners. Start. I'm sorry. I know. <laughs> well, thank you for all the leadership you are providing us during this time. I have a question: like, how bad do you think the budget will get? Do you think we'll have furloughs? Are there any plans on, like, how how, how secure are our jobs? Right. Well, Jan, right right now uh, we have received no um, indication as to what uh, type of a budget uh, reduction we might receive. Uh, I just came out of Board of Governors meeting this morning. We had a day and a half of, of VOG meetings. There was uh, you know, very little discussed in terms of um, what that shortfall might look like. Uh, we, you know, I've been reading just as you have been and hearing that uh, the, the state budget uh, shortfall could be anywhere between 1.5 and $2.5 billion. And um, so uh, we are uh, right now, you know, there is not a hiring freeze, uh, but the system office has asked uh, all 17 campuses to be uh, extremely uh, careful and responsible regarding uh, new hires, uh, regarding salary adjustments, and, uh, and really only making hires that where they are essential, and they're putting that in the hands of the chancellors and provosts. And so Bob and I have been working closely with HR in looking at this. Uh, uh, we have about 450 vacancies, uh, vacant positions here at Carolina right now. And uh, I will tell you that uh, probably less than 10% of those are going to be filled uh, here uh, or allowed to move forward over the next uh, a few months. Uh, we have to be fiscally responsible in terms of until we know what kind of shortfall there is. But, uh, but for right now, we're doing everything possible, as I've said, to protect uh, the people and the core mission of, of this university. 
Um, now, um, Hillary Lithgow has a question about the undergraduates on campus. Um, Professor Lithgow, you can ask your question. Hi, thanks. I'm just curious, you mentioned 650 students um, in residence halls or still on campus. And um, talking with those students in our courses, you know, they're the only one on their dorm floor or they're only one in their building. Um, are there efforts in place right now or in process to help connect them with each other so they can do socially distanced um, kind of finding out who else is on campus? I'm just, I'm really concerned about the students that, I'm, that I know who are, seem very alone right now. Sure, no, thank you. And, and we, you know, we have the, the student care hub that uh, we've been strongly encouraging those students, especially to stay connected with. Uh, our, um, you know, Student Affairs has, has done a, a really great job. Um, uh, the Jonathan Sauls and Alan Blattner and his team of staying connected to those students, uh, most of them. And, and we had about 850 students originally who qualified for the uh, special circumstances waiver uh, that I think I mentioned uh, the last meeting that we had. And these were students who had hardships or, or they were um, um, students you know, who were here from abroad, they couldn't get home um, uh, and, uh, or didn't have internet access at home in some of the other parts of the state. Uh, so we are, uh, that number continues to trickle down. It was, I think each week uh, there are students who are deciding to head back home, but uh, that number is probably slightly below 650 at this point. But yes, we're doing everything possible to keep them connected to campus. And, and I will say that, um, you know, we anticipate that when it is determined safe to open back up, that there will be a gradual re-entry. And uh, that's part of the scenario plan that we're looking at in terms of how we would begin to reintegrate and, and allow students to, to gather in uh, perhaps smaller group settings. Thanks. Thanks for your concern. Yeah, thank you. Okay, now um, Jessica Boone has a question. Um, Professor Boone, please ask your question. Thank you. Uh, I was just curious, you had a brief phrase about uh, when you were discussing options for the fall about possibly an alternative schedule for the fall. Um, that's a very brief statement. I didn't know if you could speak more about that or if you could tell us at least when we might, might be hearing more about the fall, whether it be by the end of May or the middle of August. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. That's a great question. So we have a call every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, in which we have uh, at least one, if not two of our infectious disease experts on it. And they're questioned often about, you know, what does the curve look like? We talk about flattening the curve. And what we're learning is that it's the tail on that curve, that the, the rate at which it uh, declines. And it's, you know, it's happening apparently, according to the experts, you know, a little differently in certain regions of the country. And in uh, and, and many places, we, you know, we haven't even seen the peak yet, obviously, but uh, the answer to your question is going to really dictate what that rate of decline in the curve looks like and how much social distancing is required after that, according to Mike Cohen and David Weber and others. And so the scenarios we're looking at would be that we'll, we think we're going to have a much clearer picture by the end of May is what uh, we're hearing, so because we, did, we have closed down all sort of group activities on campus for the month of June. And so what I promised people is that we would make a decision the end of May whenever our infectious disease experts have told us we'll have a better, um, more clear picture of what July and August might look like. And, uh, and certainly by mid uh, to late June, they think we'll have a better picture of what uh, August could look like. And that, so if it was looking as if it was gonna be risky to um, open back up and bring people back all at one time in mid-August, then it could be that we're looking at a delayed start. Uh, we have about five, six different scenarios that we have this working group uh, looking at. And I promise you, as I've told Suzanne, that we'll bring this to the faculty, uh, faculty advisory committee for some input here uh, over the next uh, several weeks uh, once the working group provides um, some more um, definitive, so we went on definitive, but I guess more, more clear picture of what the various scenarios could look like. But it could be that we, you know, start after Labor Day and try to squeeze a semester in. Uh, it would obviously push the, the date back, you know, for finals closer up to the end of December. And, and you know, that could be a challenge as well. So we're going to hear from people what that would uh, potentially look like. Uh, other options would, you know, the worst case scenario, I think, is that we would, for some reason, would need to be entirely remote, um, uh, you know, online for the fall semester, much like we are, we have been for the past uh, four or five weeks. So 
looking at a bunch of scenarios. And then uh, Deb Icott has a question. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, Chancellor, uh, we commend your leadership at this critical time. I still remember on a Friday afternoon in December, I think it was December 13th, uh, you were inducted as our 12th Chancellor. So we really appreciate what you are doing at this critical time. Um, and you mentioned that we, we may aim for August 17th as a day when we have the convocation and everything. I feel that uh, even in places like Canada, uh, in China, Canada, and Germany, which are trying to go back uh, to usual life, they are practicing social distancing. And I would imagine that on our campus, we have so many large classes, so many large gatherings. Uh, and I was wondering, and I know your task force may be looking into this, how we would try to figure this in, even if the classes are resumed. Yes, and, and that's one of the scenarios would be that uh, we could not hold uh, gatherings, uh, you know, large gatherings. Uh, so, it could, it, and again, what's the right number? I mean, if you remember what we've been through over the past four to six weeks, I mean, it was, you know, the gatherings no more than 100, then we went to 50, and then we went to 10. And so it, it could be that our infectious disease experts recommend uh, some number uh, for some period of time, such that we would have to uh, teach those larger courses um, remotely as we're doing now, even if everybody were back here on campus and um, taking from the residence halls, if you're in a large gateway course, perhaps needing to take that class for some period of time remotely until we could gather as a larger group and, and we would only have smaller group settings. So that's, that again, that's a scenario that's being considered that I, I fully expect based on what we're hearing that, that we'll have to think about some a, a gradual re-entry uh, but uh, but again, I want to be really careful that we don't get too far out in front of this because all we're doing right now is uh, preparing various scenarios so that we would be ready once we do know from the experts uh, uh, and whether that's in late May or late June that we would be prepared to pivot to a, a an agreed upon uh, safe option. Thank you. Thanks, Deb. And I enjoyed your class the other day. Thanks for inviting me in. Thank you for it. our students enjoyed interacting with you. Thank you. And there aren't any other questions in the chat, but I think Vin um, Stephanidis has something to say. Uh, yes, I just wanted to jump in very briefly and remind uh, folks that um, those listening or watching it on the live stream on YouTube can submit questions via poll everywhere. Um, and, and so it, um, just the, the link for how to do that is right there in the YouTube feed, right, um, right in the comments section. So uh, I just want to be sure that people are aware of that. And I, I think Emily has a question. Maybe she could throw the question up on the screen or convey it. Sure. Hang on one second. I'll share that. This is truly a, okay. So can everyone see the question? Where is the response to the statement by the GPSF and the response to the petition signed by about 450 graduate students? The, uh, the uh, response to the Grad Professional Student Federation is, our, uh, is the response from the university to the, um, the questions that uh, have been raised. And uh, so uh, the, the G I'm assuming the Grad Professional Student Federation We'll, we'll post that and uh, I'll talk with our communications team about, um, about how we would post the response as well. And, and, and just the, the Graduate Professional Student Federation is the elected body of the graduate students and uh, uh, we received a, a very um, a good email the other day uh, with, with questions and, and also referencing the other uh, few letters that we have received and, and we felt that it was that the response to the uh, Grad Professional Student Federation, the elected body of the graduate students was the appropriate um, uh, way to, to, to respond to the concerns and questions. I know that your response along with uh, Provost Bluen and uh, Dean Barber has circulated among faculty because um, it was forwarded to department chairs as well. 
And if I could just say that the response is that uh, with, with the Graduate Professional Student Federation's uh, concerns that were raised, we're, we're really uh, in response to the challenges that our students have had with respect to COVID-19. Uh, and, and that's what where we are focused right now is on helping all of our students. And, and, and as I've already said, the graduate students are very important to our mission. We wanna be sure that uh, we are holding all students as harmless as possible throughout all of this. And so uh, that's what we are focused on right now are, are the challenges faced by the, the, the pandemic. Thank you. Helena, we might have time for one more question and then we're gonna uh, go on to the program. There are no more questions. Okay. Well, um, um, I, Lloyd, I have one more question from the um, live stream. Okay. The question, the question reads, does the university anticipate higher rates of attrition? If so, how will that be mitigated? We have no indication right now that that's the case. Uh, Bob may uh, have uh, uh, further indication. I know that he's met with, um, uh, I think with Becky more recent, Becky Mangini more recently than I have, but I, I, I don't anticipate that right, right now. We don't have any information to suggest that would be the case. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And thanks again for all you're doing. And we'll, we'll keep you uh, here in one of the boxes, but we're going to move Bob Bluen into the spotlight. And we're moving now to comments from the provost. Well, thank you very much, Lloyd. And uh, I, I would uh, want to just uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, Kevin uh, for his leadership and, uh, and, and appreciate uh, all of the comments that, that he made. Uh, very uh, thorough presentation of uh, where the university is. I, uh, I'd like to begin my comments by, first of all, um, thanking um, all of the faculty I can uh, remember the, at, at the last uh, meeting that we had, I, uh, I asked the faculty uh, to work uh, with us uh, in, in beginning uh, the transformation of their courses uh, to, to remote uh, learning and instructional courses uh, on behalf of the interests of our students. It has been incredibly remarkable uh, how, how well um, things have gone uh, and particularly uh, how, how patient and, and conscientious our faculty have been. And, and in particular, um, keeping our students uh, foremost um, on their minds and trying their very best uh, to accommodate uh, wherever possible. I know that I, I try to emphasize uh, to all of our faculty uh, uh, how, how challenging these times are um, for all of us, uh, but particularly to our students. And our students um, have really uh, been challenged in, in, in many ways, uh, as you would, would expect. Uh, so, so many of our students had, had plans, um, uh, graduation plans, uh, postgraduate uh, intentions, uh, going to medical school, going to law school, going to other professional programs. Uh, our other students um, very much programmed into uh, staying on pace, on track with their programs. Uh, having summer jobs uh, and experiences that they had worked so hard uh, to achieve, including summer abroad programs and beginning to prepare for, for fall semesters and fall study abroad uh, opportunities. So all of these things have been turned upside down. Their world has been turned upside down. Uh, to, to, uh, to add uh, upon that, um, they, they now face the, the challenge of uh, of, of families uh, being affected directly and indirectly by this uh, virus, uh, whether it be directly in the form of illness uh, or indirectly in the form of um, uh, uh, families, uh, particularly parents, uh, perhaps losing their jobs and, and, and their primary income. All of this is putting an incredible uh, amount of uh, pressure and stress onto our students. Uh, I know that all of you uh, have been concerned about uh, mental health issues um, uh, across our society long before COVID-19 uh, and, and also uh, mental health issues uh, on our campus. But I think all of you realize that uh, this has escalated uh, and, and the stress that now has been put upon all of us, but particularly our students, has never been greater and never have the, have the concerns about mental health issues uh, been, been greater for us. So please, um, uh, continue uh, to, to be thoughtful, reflective, 
compassionate uh, towards our students um, as they try to uh, uh, continue out this semester and, and, and plan uh, for their future. These uh, last few weeks have been extraordinarily hectic, uh, I know for everyone. Um, one of the things that I've been trying to do with, with Kevin uh, is, to, is to stay uh, actively engaged with um, all of the members of our leadership team. Uh, and, and we've asked them to stay in touch with you, um, our staff, as well as our students. Uh, we, we've been working very hard to, to try to make sure that people have the information that they need when they need it, or at least um, as close to in real time as possible in order to make the very best decisions that you're making, whether it be with respect to your class or your research or, or, or whatever it might be. And so, um, so one of the uh, uh, approaches that uh, we've been using is uh, meeting with the deans uh, since they are a, a, an important conduit to information uh, back to the chairs uh, and ultimately to the faculty. And so in, during the first several weeks, we were meeting daily. Uh, now, uh, over the last two weeks, uh, we've been meeting um, every other day. But we've been talking about a, a wide array of things, and I share this with you only so that you understand and appreciate the fact that a lot of people behind the curtain, perhaps, uh, well, certainly behind the, this screen, um, are, are working uh, very hard uh, trying to think about all the things that might um, be affected uh, by this situation, by this crisis, and, and that you know that people are, are working hard to, um, to try to um, anticipate uh, challenges and issues uh, and, and trying to do their best, uh, try to mitigate those before they become a problem for you. So our uh, Dean's meetings have, have focused on uh, a wide array of issues, um, a, a, in, including uh, frequent updates from our um, healthcare specialists. Um, we are a university, but we are a university that is home of the UNC healthcare system. Um, and they have a, an important role and responsibility uh, to uh, try to directly uh, uh, address the challenges that uh, uh, this virus has, has put upon not only this community, but the state of North Carolina. Uh, and they have worked uh, tirelessly in, 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 in conducting you know, their work as healthcare specialists. A great cooperation uh, amongst all of our health sciences schools as a part of that um, uh, UNC healthcare system. The university has been doing its role in trying to make contributions uh, to the, uh, the, the treatment of patients by providing uh, materials, uh, particularly um, um, face masks and, and shields, you know, in order to uh, increase uh, the safety of our healthcare workers uh, as they try to do their work in, in saving lives across the state. So um, certainly that's been one area that we've given uh, a lot of attention to. But we've also talked about uh, how we can continuously uh, improve the teaching and learning uh, remotely. Uh, how can we be responsive to both faculty and students to make sure that we have the very best uh, um, outcome as we possibly can. Uh, there's a wide array of human resource issues and, uh, and, and, and Becky Mangini has been terrific in keeping us up to speed on uh, all the changes that are taking place, uh, keeping a, an open line of communications uh, with the system office and, and trying our best to, to, to take um, actions forward as quickly as we can. Uh, it's been amazing that uh, from a technology standpoint that uh, at least for the most part, um, things have held up pretty well. And I, I really wanna thank all of our colleagues in ITS, uh, particularly Mike Barker and his team uh, for doing the, the work that, that they have been doing to make sure the portals are all working and, and you have access to the information that you need from afar. And, and I know Terry Magnuson has been working closely with the seniors, uh, with the associate deans for research and doing uh, their best to um, keep um, essential uh, research activities um, uh, current and, and ongoing. Um, as as uh, the chancellor said, uh, we are the, the national leader in, in COVID-19 research. We have a wide array of, uh, of, of research programs that are actively um, uh, being engaged in on campus as we speak, and we're doing our best to make sure that they stay active. And we also know that there are graduate students um, who have um, uh, immediate needs of trying to complete their graduate work uh, either by May or, or by December, and we've 
acknowledged uh, the importance and critical nature of that work. So we've identified that as, as essential uh, research um, uh, worthy of, of, of an exemption uh, for uh, uh, laboratory use. And, and we've also been engaged in uh, discussions about summer school as we've made decisions to move forward with summer school via remote um, uh, technology uh, and, and the, the challenges that are associated with that in bringing all of our faculty um, up to a level where they're comfortable in delivering uh, that technology uh, to our students. And thank uh, uh, Todd Nicolette for all the, the work that, that he and his team um, have been doing in order to make sure that the, uh, all, all of the remote educational programming is going um, as smoothly as it possibly can. And, and I do wanna uh, thank very much uh, uh, Suzanne Barber for all of her leadership as it relates to the graduate program and being uh, a liaison uh, to, to not only the graduate students, but to the uh, individual schools that oversee these graduate programs and their departments, as we try to make sure that all of this has a minimum impact on, on the graduate students. And finally, I, I would just uh, like to say that we, we had originally on the agenda to, to provide a, a significant update on our data science initiative uh, we decided not to um, go into that in any detail uh, today, mainly because of the crisis that we have around us and that we thought that uh, it was probably not the right time to be talking about a new initiative. But I do just want you to know that um, uh, the faculty, particularly the faculties in, uh, in SILS and in computer science uh, and in STORE have, have been working very closely uh, with my office uh, we will continue to have uh, significant con uh, conversations about uh, the potential uh, for building out a new school of data science. When, when the time comes, we will um, bring those ideas back to you for your consideration. We hope that you've all had a chance to review uh, the steering committee's report on data science. And, uh, and at some point in the future, we can uh, discuss that in more detail. And so with that, um, uh, Lloyd is my report. Thank you, Bob. And we have uh, just a few minutes if there are questions. Uh, Helena, can you uh, guide us to any questioners? Yes. Uh, Deb Icat has a question um, for the provost about final exams. Go ahead. Go ahead, Deb. Um, can you hear me? I, I, I can. Okay, so I just wanted to mention uh, that, um, dear provost, we commend your leadership at this critical time. Thanks for all you are doing. And we appreciate your emails to faculty and campus community. And you created a, a COVID uh, student care hub to support our students. It has helped several of our students. I feel uh, respectfully that our campus should also have a, a care hub for our faculty and staff who are hurting. I say this because the COVID pandemic has disrupted our lives and it has disrupted the lives of our students and you have taken care of them in the hub, uh, but also of our faculty and colleagues. So if you could consider that. And I have a quick, another question, um, which is, as you know, the final exams begin on April 27th. Most exams are being offered online, uh, as you know. Uh, some of our faculty colleagues have asked if we have an online proctoring system for the final exams. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the suggestion. And, uh, and you're right, um, it's, not, it's not only the students who, who have been affected uh, by COVID-19, uh, it has affected all of us uh, and uh, uh, I, I think your suggestion of uh, creating uh, something, a resource for faculty and staff, uh, like a, a care hub for them is an, is an excellent idea and, and we'll certainly give that uh, careful consideration. Um, final exams, I, I have uh, had a new number of conversations with the deans uh, as well as uh, with uh, Todd Nicolette and, and members of the, of the college. Uh, and, and, and so there, there, there is uh, an established set of guidances that have been uh, put out uh, in the uh, Keep Teaching uh, website. And, um, and there, there, there are some nice uh, ideas there in terms of uh, how to uh, conduct 
final examinations. Um, th this is a very uh, individualized uh, issue um, based upon the course and this instructor. And I, and I do know that, that Todd and his team are ready to help um, any faculty member uh, who, who feels that uh, they would benefit from additional uh, consideration in terms of how they might approach the delivery of a final exam and, and also how they might approach the, the grading um, of the courses given uh, the nature of, of uh, the situation that we find ourselves in. Uh, we, we feel that we have a very nice um, option, you know, with regards to, to students uh, with respect to pass fail. Uh, and, and, and I think that approach, you know, ha is, is going to, to enable um, them to work uh, 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 clearly in, in, in favor of uh, uh, making sure that they get through the semester um, uh, unharmed. Thank you. Um, okay, I think we might have time for one or two more questions, either from Emily or Helena. Um, we have one question that came in through the live stream. The question asks, have folks considered smaller class sizes if we meet in person in the fall? Yes, um, so we, we are uh, looking at all um, possibilities uh, for the fall. Uh, and, and certainly we will have to, uh, it, it, if we were to um, start up in the fall, which we're all uh, certainly hoping uh, for that, um, we, we realize that uh, we will not be going back to uh, normal. Uh, that uh, none of the experts, none of our infectious disease, virology, uh, public health um, experts, are telling us that we're going to be able to go back um, uh, in the fall, even if even if things look favorable, and, and and consider conducting business as usual. So there there are going to need to be um, a, a lot of uh, considerations in terms of staying faithful to um, social distancing uh, and and also uh, monitoring. Of course, as, as I think all of you know, as you've been paying attention to the news. Um, uh, all of you know that uh, an important part of coming back together will be uh, testing, uh, testing in the form of uh, viral testing and also testing in the form of antibody or, or um, immunity testing. And so um, uh, a lot of our approaches are going to be um, informed as, as Kevin mentioned earlier uh, by, by the experts, you know, people who are going to uh, help us fully understand um, what what the the risk benefit ratio is of of doing various things, and 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 our number one priority. I I, I hope I can um, say this that this represents you know our, our university's position, and that is that uh, that safety um, is is foremost on our minds, the safety of our faculty, staff, and, and our students, and so we we, we certainly would think that uh, there, there may be the need for, for smaller class sizes um, as we return, but um, I, I wouldn't say with any um, certainty how that might uh, get expressed. So we have two questions on the chat. Um, first, one from Jan Honig and then Chris Willett. So go ahead, um, Professor Honig. And these will be the last questions before we move on. Thank you. Thank you, Provost. Blowing. It's, these are difficult times. I had a question about the COVID-19 research, whether there is a place where the university is publicizing what we are all doing and whether we are communicating how important we, we are to stakeholders like what, the legislature or the board of governors. Yes, uh, thank you so much for that question, Jan. And actually, uh, the chancellor did send out a, a really nice communication uh, to all of our governing bodies and key legislators to inform them of uh, not only uh, about the wonderful research that's being done here at this university, uh, but also many of the other wonderful things that are being done on behalf of our students and, and the citizens of North Carolina. So uh, I think that was a very important message uh, for, for the chancellor to send out. and. Um, and, and that, that has been done. 
to your uh, more immediate question about a, a place to go, uh, yes, Terry Magnuson, our vice chancellor for research, you know, has accumulated a, a list of uh, of um, uh, res research uh, labs and the work that they are doing, uh, and I believe it is posted, you know, on his website, and and so you may check there uh, for the a comprehensive uh, summary of uh, the relevant COVID-19 research that's taking place on this campus. And if you can't find it, uh, if, I'm, if I'm mistaken for some reason, um, then uh, please, please feel free to uh, contact me back or, or Terry directly, but I'm pretty sure it's uh, available on that site. Okay, now Chris Willett, um, please go ahead. Hi, yeah, this is Chris Willett from Biology. I just had a question about um, Kind of the non-essential kind of normal research that's going that's not going on on campus now and you know is that will the university's policy be largely shaped by like stay-at-home orders from the governor or are we developing our own policies for when we can resume that sort of research well, th well, well thank you chris for that question um you know we we are trying to stay faithful to the intent of the governor's edict um, through um, in our interpretation of uh, social distancing and also what, what we're, in, we're interpreting as essential work. And we've tried to translate that in, from the, the perspective of risk and risk benefit. And so, um, so yes, we, we have somewhat identified um, certain things that we have deemed essential. Uh, and, and, and so we're, we, we have very specific criteria as, as, as uh, Vice Chancellor um, Magnuson has, has listed in his communication to the campus. I, I think that there, uh, at the end of uh, May, as, as um, the, the Chancellor has mentioned, we'll be reevaluating a lot of decisions um, that we have made with regards to campus activities, including research. And, uh, and I think it would be somewhere around that time that we would take a fresh look at um, how we might be defining essential versus non-essential research. Thank you very much, Bob. It's very helpful. And thanks for all you've been doing to uh, manage all kinds of issues. And I know we'll continue talking with you about these issues as they evolve. So thank you. Uh, the next item on the agenda is a report of it on the task force work, the task force that's worked on promotion and tenure. And the speaker for this will be our executive vice provost, Ron Strauss, who has led that Task Force. So, Ron, come in from wherever you are. There you are. Uh, it's wonderful to be meeting with you this afternoon and to be talking about this uh, task force report. It went out with a cover letter to all of you, and I know from the large number of questions I've received that uh, you actually read the report. And um, so I'm going to just walk through a, a little bit of a, a, a slideshow here. Next slide, please. Um, uh, the uh, report um, was uh, the result of a charge by the provost to the task force to investigate and make recommendations on promotion and tenure practices and policies across the campus. And there are 49 uh, various recommendations in the report. Um, it was also to uh, look at the impact of changing library relationships with journal publishers uh, just to, as you've heard in the council on several occasions, to see the impact of that on promotion and tenure, and then to provide recommendations and statements to give insight and to thereby improve promotion and tenure policies. Next slide, please. Um, there were some major foci for the report um, recommendations. They included uh, early promotion and tenure decisions, how we manage external offers and promotion reviews. Um, how do we recognize uh, statisticians and other research methodologists and varied funding sources in promotion and tenure actions? Um, it was also to look at the timing of permanent tenure decisions. Um, also looked at school level tenure denials and how those are reported to the university. Uh, we, we also looked at uh, the practice and professional tracks that exist in some of our schools. Uh, we looked at various other forms, for instance, 
search waivers and small numbers on certain searches um, to see if there was integrity to the search process. Much of our scrutiny looked at the relationship between the fixed term and the tenure track faculty. Um, but we also looked at voting policy and practices, both in person and electronically. Uh, we looked at um, how do you um, onboard administrators and faculty members and had a very uh, productive set of meetings about underrepresented minority faculty experiences in the promotion and tenure environment. Um, and very much of that talked about the import of mentoring, um, as well as, as I mentioned, library relationships. Next slide, please. So the task force met 10 times beginning in February, 2019. Um, the report was discussed last summer with the provost. And then it began a round of reviews by stakeholders uh, that actually continue to write today because that's what we're doing. Um, but ultimately, uh, we got great feedback from very many different places. Um, if, next slide, please. Um, including faculty executive committee, uh, the committee of APT, which is going to present two um, uh, proposals to you this afternoon, the committee on the status of women, fixed term faculty committee, the library administrative board, uh, in the College of Arts and Sciences, the Council of Chairs. Uh, we met with department chairs in the Skillings School of Global Public Health and with all of the deans um, in the uh, provost leadership cabinet um, who actually voted to support this um, and with the senior associate deans in each of the schools who have a council. And finally, with the um, Office of University Attorneys and Council. So it's, it's been through a great number of reviews. Um, that doesn't mean that it's perfect by any measure. The reason we're bringing it to you today is that this is so close to the heart of faculty life and the values that the faculty have that we certainly didn't wanna go forward with it um, beyond uh, your, your opportunity to speak as a faculty. Next slide, please. Um, the major changes that you'll find in the report are, of, are kind of really interesting. We promote the concept of meeting the mark relative to early promotion. And that means when you're ready for promotion, when your accomplishments are at a level that is consistent with promotion, then you're ready to go forward. Not that there's a specific timetable, though there are some minimums. Um, we recognized the necessity to think about how we include previous career experiences, especially at other universities in our own tenure and promotion world. Um, we looked at including spousal hiring as part of faculty retention. And much of that has actually started to happen already. And then we introduced something that as far as I know is novel to the academy, which is variable track hiring. We've proposed a new track for the faculty. Um, this is not for faculty, this is not for you. This is for new faculty who would be recruited into this variable track, would be advertised as a track in which they come in not certain that they're going to be tenure track or fixed term, but having the opportunity during their time on the variable track to define the direction that they want to go in as consistent with the needs and wishes of the school and the faculty member. It gives us enormous flexibility. And um, we hear from many people that they look forward to using this in hiring people, um, especially um, in the health affairs side of the campus. We can talk about that more. Um, we looked at track changes, switches from track to track, um, trying to make sure that the structures that we have for that have um, integrity and fit our aspirations to um, not do uh, searches that don't have full um, openness to them. Uh, we did talk about undoing the 18 month rule. That's a rule in which uh, we did not permit people 
who, who came to UNC um, as associate professors to come up for tenure for 18 months. And for complicated reasons, that rule was not working in our recruitment efforts. So this opened up flexibility to recruit people who might be offered tenure at the time of recruitment. Um, we also have some proposals to track tenure denials so that we can know when that occurs. Um, we've clarified criteria for both the practice track and professional track that doesn't exist in every school, but in, in places like School of Government and uh, the School of uh, Journalism and Media, you will find people who are primarily practitioners, but are on a tenure um, career. Um, we also have some guidance for dealing with searches that yield very few, few applicants, less than five applicants. Um, how do you manage those? Uh, we've looked at and made recommendations about um, fac fixed term faculty term length, uh, the ways you entitle fixed term faculties, and um, what kind of notice they should get at the end of their um, term or appointment. Um, there was some very interesting discussion around um, our underrepresented minority faculty um, and valuing their scholarship as directed to um, particular communities. Um, and in particular, the, what they call invisible labor which is the labor that is uh, supporting the inclusion and diversity objectives of the university, but allowing them to reflect that on the CV. Um, we also call for annual diversity reports from the units as part of the Dean's annual review with the provost and spent quite a bit of time thinking about the value of choice in faculty mentorship um, including asking for an opportunity for mentees to evaluate mentors. Um, next slide, please. Uh, this is the list of the people that were on the task force. They're from all over the university. Uh, they worked really hard on this. Um, numbers of them are here today on this call, uh, but it, it's uh, really been a, a delight to uh, work with them. Um, and so I'll jump to see if there are any questions at this point. So you can take down the names. Great. And Thank let's you, see if we can. Uh, we'll follow the same policy. Helena, can you advise us on chat questions? Questions or comments, it can um, be either. We, uh, we have a question from, uh, well, we have a, um, first of all, we'll just go with Eric Muller has a question about the task force report. Great. Go ahead. Hi, hi everyone and hi Ron. Um, hi Eric. Hi. Um, so I actually have a number of questions about this, and I don't want to um, I don't want to dominate things and take too long. So I, I I guess I could use a little bit of advice, maybe on what the best way to proceed would be. Should I take the many of them and just send them directly to you privately? Would that be best? Do you think? Um, I, I would very much appreciate that if you've got a number of questions that are not going to happen in the next five or 10 minutes. But um, I do wanna say that we consider this report a draft. Yeah. We're modifying it each with each engagement. And certainly we wanna hear from faculty members. Many people from the council wrote to me in advance of this meeting and said, I read the report. This is my question. We've been back and forth. Um, so Eric, yes, unless there's a question in particular that you wanna make sure yeah, Everybody let, me just, here. let me just look through. Um, I, uh, so um, I have a couple of questions about the transition from fixed term to tenure track. This is recommendations 14 and 15. Um, uh, the one question regarding 14 is um, when the track change occurs, does the accomplishment clock restart for that person in their move towards eventual promotion and then tenure or do they do they continue to count the things that they did when they were not on the tenure track? So um, since we have introduced the notion of meet the mark as the measure, um, it's not really about the clock so much as 
the accomplishment. And so when each unit has the opportunity to develop their version of what it takes to be promoted and tenured. And when the person gets to that level of accomplishment, um, then they're ready. And yes, it does take into account their full career as always we do, um, not just the career since the time that they wanted to make a, a switch. Gotcha. L let me ask very quickly about um, uh, paragraph 22. Um, this has to do with people coming, associate professors coming without tenure um, from another university. And I'm looking at the second paragraph of 22, which says, um, if it's the judgment of the dean, et cetera, um, mm -hmm. that the untenured person has demonstrated compelling evidence of meeting UNC Chapel Hill's criteria, um, they may initiate formal consideration for tenure during the initial probationary appointment. And I was wondering if that means that it can't then be initiated before. In other words, in the recruitment itself, because it, it says that the formal consideration for tenure can be initiated during the probationary appointment. But I know that there have been situations now in the distant past in which we've um, sort of put a, a tenure process into place while we were sort of completing the recruitment of an individual. So this is a little bit of a complicated question uh, because the way we work it is when you're first being recruited, you go into a nominated position and then you come up for a permanent position um, as soon as possible. And so this would be as part of the recruitment, but you would still, you have to go through um, a, uh, an appointment promotion dossier process. Right. Um, so it, it is. Um, but that can start before the person actually shows up. Yes, that can. Right, gotcha. Let me do one more and then I'll stop. It's on page, it's number 34 on page 10 um, about voting processes. Um, it says ballots must allow voters to explain negative and abstain votes. Um, and the question is just about the verb allow. I had sort of understood that require was was what we were doing but are we moving away from that now and making it a uh, making it a permissive thing no i think allow is in the sense of require ah okay thank you yes. i'll stop now i'll send you a few more ron by email great i love that okay next next question is from larry chavis go ahead hi larry it's me hi ron hi everyone um I'll apologize. Uh, well, first, let me say this is like uh, bringing me to tears. It seems incredible, actually, that um, uh, there's so many things in this report that are that just would make UNC um, <clears throat> way out in front of uh, so many places and could do great things for diversity of our faculty and inclusion. Uh, and along those lines, I'll ask a, a, a bit of a <clears throat> self-serving question is, um, have there been any discussions, considerations for those of us who had these policies been in place when we were on tenure track uh, and, um, you know, our labors were not counted, uh, that we may be able to, I don't know, get tenure <laughs> uh, or at least be considered, I guess, is what I'm asking. So um, there, as we allow the possibility of track changes in this document. Um, it would be possible for people who are currently on the fixed term, for instance, uh, to visit with their dean and department chair um, about sure. whether they're actually meeting the mark for uh, a tenure, tenured or um, promotion situation. Um, so this is not, um, you know, we don't want to w throw the door wide open and have everybody think that everyone's going to migrate to the tenure track, or quite the reverse. I don't think that's likely to happen. And by the way, uh, we know from our fixed term faculty that many of them are happier being in the fixed term than they actually oh, sure, are sure. in tenured situations. But for those individuals, and they're rare, for whom um, their, their aspirations and accomplishments are consistent with tenure and promotion. This report allows that flexibility. Great, thank you. As a matter of fact, what this report does is actually infuses 
flexibility into our whole process in a way that um, it's been a bit more rigid than it probably needed to be. Most people that have looked at it have said they can see many ways in which it will be more flexible to meet the needs of, uh, of the faculty and the university. Do we have time for one more question? There are no more questions. Oh, wow. Well, then I cede, thank you. This was great. And I cede the uh, speaker's position to uh, Steve Cruz. Steve is uh, the chair of the uh, Appointment, Promotion, and Tenure Committee. He's from the School of Medicine. And Steve, take it away. All right, thanks, Ron. So on behalf of APT, I would like to submit and recommend two resolutions. The first is 2020-2 on endorsing the recommendations of the Task Force on Promotion and Tenure Policies and Practices. This resolution endorses the recommendations within the Task Force report while also supporting the idea that schools and units can implement these recommendations as fits their needs and mission. And I'll add that over the years, APT has discussed many of these recommendations and enthusiastically endorses them and unanimously voted to endorse them. We believe that the recommendations are overwhelmingly positive for UNC and its faculty. And I'll also mention that two members of APT, myself and Steve Hooper, served on the task force committee. The second resolution is 2020-3 on amending the trustee policies to eliminate the 18 month rule for awarding tenure. This resolution recommends that the trustee policies and regulations governing academic tenure be amended to allow tenure in less than 18 months after the start of active employment where appropriate. Thus, except where expressly limited, promotions and rank may be made at any time during a faculty member's employment. And APT is in favor of this amendment and believes it will enhance the ability of UNC to hire outstanding faculty. And I'll stop there. Okay, this, uh, this is Lloyd again. I just wanted to say before we actually go into the procedure of the uh, resolutions, I'd just like to open the floor. Are there any comments or questions uh, before we turn to consideration? This is Eric Muller, I have one. Hi, Eric, I, yeah. um, the question is simply um, about how this 2020-2 um, relates to what Ron just said about um, the possibility of continued change to the, to the recommendations in the task force based on questions and comments. So uh, am I, I mean, I'm assuming that the faculty council's endorsement, which I will support and fully expect, um, that that won't foreclose the possibility of um, changes should uh, questions arise that have not yet been addressed. That's right. So changes will be made afterwards. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, are there other general questions or comments? Or if not, I will hand this over to the Secretary of the Faculty to manage the process of the resolution consideration. There are no more questions right now. Oh, um, oh, somebody asked a question. Are we voting to prove this as a draft? Um, Nancy, do you want to go ahead and explain? Sorry, right, I'm not sure. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wasn't quite sure since uh, Ron was just saying that this is a draft, uh, that, that was my question. We're not just approving this as it is, we're approving this to go forward in its intent. If I may speak, I, I, that's the way I would read the resolution, uh, that, that, that you know, this kind of approving these in principle, understanding that there may be some, some tweaks, but it's, it's you know, does, does this in its current state look generally pretty good? That I guess maybe that's one way to put it. And I invite Ron or Steve to, to I, you know, add anything. Uh, I would just say that that's the, it's a general endorsement of the uh, intent of this report. If there are gonna be some minor changes, if there are major changes, we might bring them back to the council. But I, you know, uh, the kinds of feedback I've been getting, it's mostly um, small, either word changes or uh, questions. 
it hasn't really been um, the kind of major change. Really, what we would like to do is go to the Board of Trustees and know that we have the general endorsement of the council, that we're not going without your interest and support. Great, thank you. Excuse me, could I just comment on that? The, the, the one difference is that resolution 2022, the, the one about the 18 month rule, that is a specific policy recommendation that would be yeah. step forward mm -hmm. as approved by the um, faculty committee. That that's, correct? Co that's correct, yes. That takes a change in the tenure code. So that's a, a, that's a different thing. Yeah. That's the only big change that requires the action of the Board of Trustees. They really don't have to vote on this, except that we, of course, want to share what we're doing with them. And, and if I may jump in on that, I mean, the reason we have a, a second resolution is that our, our tradition has been that, that if we, you know, if there's going to be a change in the tenure policies that the Board of Trustees has to enact, um, you know, faculty council has, weighed in on sp the specific wording changes. If they're going to change those policies, it's, you know, we want to be able to see what they're going to do or at least recommend some specific wording changes. And so that's why we also had that second resolution that isn't just a general endorsement, but endorses a specific change in the wording of the tenure policies, which affect the entire university. So we have a question about the voting procedures. Right. So, so when we're um, when um, it, why don't we first make sure that there if there are any other questions on the resolutions in general, let's take care of those first, and then I'll I'll when I start the parliamentary process, I'll explain those procedures. There are not any other questions in the chat right now. Okay. Okay. So I will then go ahead, and so. Um, Welcome to voting in Zoom world, everyone. Uh, and uh, so uh, what it will do is now that the two resolutions have been introduced by the chair of the Appointments, Promotion and Tenure Committee, uh, what we'll do is we'll sort of take up each resolution in turn. But before I do that, um, I wanna just explain how um, the voting will work. And so um, Zoom has a, a built-in polling process. Uh, in which all folks who are attendees and, and only faculty council members are attendees at this point, as opposed to panelists, uh, only the att attendees will uh, be able to vote. And so um, what I'll do for each resolution is this. I will state the question. I will then um, uh, open the floor for us to discuss the question or debate it. Um, and then when we're done with the discussion, I will do two things. I'll first see if people are willing to pass the resolution by unanimous consent. And basically in that scenario, I will just ask, do we have unanimous consent to pass this resolution? If no one objects, then the resolution is considered passed. If at least one person objects and they can object either because they, they you know, object to the resolution or they could object because they wanna actually bring it to a vote either way. In that case, I will then launch the poll. And when I launch the poll, what you'll see on your screen is a ballot where you can either vote yes, no, or abstain on the question. Uh, people will then click on the appropriate button um, and I'll give it a few, you know, a little bit of time um, to let the votes accumulate. And then when, when the poll ends, I will share the results of that poll with everyone in this meeting. And, and it'll just be a sort of percentage of yes, no, and abstain votes. So, so it'll be like a visual version of a voice vote. Um, so so that's, um, that's the process. And, and so we'll do that for each of the resolutions in turn. And so before we move to that point, are, are there any questions about the process? There, there are no questions in the chat. Okay, so, um, and, and when we're in the debate, I'll, let me just put it, um, you know, put this out in front too. Uh, you know, I will, I will take questions in the Zoom meeting. Since this is a vote of the faculty council, um, you know, I will sort of privilege the questions that come from faculty council, which are the ones that are coming in via Zoom 
rather than whole everywhere. So let us, um, if there's, if there are no further comments, um, let me move on and state the question uh, of resolution 2020-2 on endorsing the recommendations of the task force on promotion and tenure policies and practices. Um, I will not read the resolution. You all um, have it in front of you. Um, uh, and, and here it is. And essentially it's a general endorsement of the, um, of the, the promotion and tenure task force recommendations while recognizing that individual schools and units will be able to implement or adapt these recommendations um, as, they, as they bring them into, into being. So uh, let me open the floor for any, any questions, um, any, any debate. Oh. Um, I did get a question on chat about the, the, the voting polling link. That will appear when I launch the poll, not just yet. So when we're done with, uh, with the discussion is when you'll see the ballot. So hearing, um, hearing no questions and um, no discussion and seeing nothing in the chat, I will go ahead and launch the first poll. And this is a vote on resolution 2020-2 on the sort of the general endorsement of uh, the recommendations of the task force. Can you see it? I will give it just a little bit more time. Okay, I don't see any further votes coming in. So I will end the poll and I will share the results. Uh, the motion passes uh, uh, unanimously with one abstention. So the motion, resolution 2020-2 carries. Okay, so let's move on uh, to the second resolution. This is resolution 2020-3, which um, proposes very a very specific change in the language of the Board of Trustees tenure policies in order to essentially um, eliminate the 18 month rule, which is one of the recommendations of the task force. We ourselves cannot change the Board of Trustees policies, but this is a request to the Board of Trustees uh, to make the change that is outlined uh, in the resolution. And the, and the rationale for this, essentially uh, that appears below the specific language changes being recommended, uh, you saw as part of this document. I, we just took that section of the report and pasted it in below the resolution so you can see it. Uh, are there any, um, uh, I, did, I do have a uh, question. Um, it says, uh, is it possible for people on the phone to vote? And unfortunately the answer is no, uh, only folks who are here online can vote. Um, so um, are, there, is there any, are there any questions or is there any discussion or debate of resolution 2020-3? Um, hearing, uh, hearing no questions, seeing none on chat, um, let us proceed uh, to a vote. Um, uh, and let's go ahead. I, I, since the, the polling worked well, let's just do the poll rather than unanimous consent. Uh, so let me launch a poll. Um, okay.
I still see some votes coming in, so I will let it run for just a few more seconds. Okay, I'm about to end the poll. Last call for votes. Uh, resolution 2020-3 passes unanimously. So uh, thank you uh, to the task force uh, and to the committee on appointments, promotion and tenure. Um, this uh, just a tremendous amount of work has gone into this and, uh, and, and um, it's really um, good that, that when this goes forward, uh, both to the schools and the departments and the board of trustees, uh, we have the support of faculty council. Then could I just add a word of appreciation to Stephen, Steve Cruz and to Ron for the great work they've done on this. And I know um, Steve's committee has been very involved. So thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thanks. You're here. And can everyone see the results that, I, that are being shared right now? I just want to double check. Everyone yeah. can see them? Okay. Yes. So, so we'll move on. All right. So um, the next item on the agenda uh, is uh, for the faculty council to um, consider a number of uh, annual reports from committees by title. We have reports that have been posted online from the administrative board of the library, from the committee on community and diversity, from the copyright committee, the educational policy committee, the faculty executive committee, the committee on scholarships, awards and student aid, and the Committee on the Status of Women. Uh, chairs or representatives from each of those committees uh, are here uh, to answer questions. Are there any questions uh, uh, regarding any of these reports um, that faculty council members uh, want to put forward? Anything? I see nothing in chat. Um, it sounds like there are no questions. So I wanna thank the chairs of those committees uh, and, and the members of all those committees for all their work. Um, it's, you know, what happens at faculty council is really the tip of a large iceberg. Uh, one reason that, that uh, so many resolutions pass so quickly in council is that the committees that put them forward have done so much work uh, to make sure that, that everything is kind of set and ready for prime time. So thanks to all those committees. Um, and, uh, and, and I think we can then move on to the next item uh, on the agenda. Lloyd, did you have anything to add? The only thing I wanna add is just my deep appreciation for the incredible work that people do on all these committees. And as you've said, the work of the council itself is made possible by the kind of detailed work that committee members do. Thank you. Uh, so now we'll move to the next item on the agenda, um, which is a ceremonial resolution. And I would invite a motion uh, from faculty council um, to suspend the rules so that we can consider this uh, ceremonial resolution. Do I have uh, such a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Anyone can speak up. Yes, there's a second. Okay. So um, I, I ask that we adopt uh, the, the motion to suspend the rules by unanimous consent. Uh, hearing no objection, uh, we, we have suspended the rules and I would invite Professor Jennifer Larson to uh, read the ceremonial resolution. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm just gonna read the resolution. I think it speaks for itself. <laughs> Um, so this is a resolution on appreciation for the service of Lloyd Kramer, chair of the faculty of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And I'm going to try to make it through it <laughs> um, with, with my voice not totally cracking. Um, so whereas Professor Lloyd Kramer has served valiantly as chair of the faculty since May of 2019, whereas he graciously and without hesitation answered the call to serve in this role. Whereas his tenure spanned one of the most challenging times in the university's history, 
whereas he consistently offered valuable historical background to provide context for an understanding of these tumultuous circumstances. Whereas he always modeled courageous and compassionate leadership, especially in his clear and assertive opposition to the UNC system settlement with the Sons of Confederate Veterans. Whereas he showed an unwavering commitment to making sure that all voices were heard and respected. Whereas he passionately reiterated the value, relevance, and practicality of academic pursuit across disciplines, especially in volatile times. And whereas he did all of these things with wisdom, grace, humility, and humor. Therefore, be it resolved that the faculty of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill expresses its profound gratitude for his exemplary service and steadfast commitment to our campus, our community, and our state. Thank you, Lloyd. So um, by, unan by unanimous consent, without objection, the resolution is adopted. And, and normally this is a time when Faculty Council would, would applaud, uh, but I, we've learned from testing that in Zoom world, Zoom's noise canceling features eliminate applause. From, so I will ask everyone present to please uh, unmute their microphone and on the count of three to say, hip, hip, hooray, thank you, Lloyd. One, two, three. Hip, 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 I, I don't know how I got through a year to get to such a point of recognition and ceremonial appreciation, but I wish I could thank each one of you personally. I would even love to shake your hands. I mean, the things that I could just love to do, which are now impossible. But nevertheless, I had no idea when the year began what lay ahead, including Zoom meetings. So what a year we've had, and it's been a great pleasure working with all of you as colleagues, with the amazing staff at the Office of Faculty Governance, with the Chancellor, the Provost, with all of the people in the colleges and schools of the university. Thank you all. What an amazing community we have. Talent beyond belief. That's what I would describe UNC Chapel Hill. Thank you all. I'm honored to have had this opportunity. Thank you, Lloyd. And I just want to also say uh, just how much personally I've enjoyed and appreciated working with Lloyd. Um, you know, he stepped in when we really, really needed him. Uh, he put a lot of things aside and did it on short notice. And uh, once he stepped in, it was just a, a, um, a joy to both work with him and to watch his leadership of, of faculty government. So I just uh, want to express my personal appreciation. Um, as Thank well. you, and, and I appreciate the fact that you actually know all the components of the faculty <laughs> code, which is the only, so, so far as I can tell, you're the only colleague who has reached that level of comprehension. Thank you. I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you, Lloyd. I appreciate that. And, and so uh, with that, um, I also, um, uh, while we are still in open session, want to thank uh, all members of faculty council, all, all those um, all members of the general faculty and others who are watching on um, the live stream on YouTube. We have one more item of business on the agenda, which requires us to go into closed session uh, in order to consider um, candidates uh, for honorary degrees. Uh, and as soon as we come, what, going to closed session means that, that we will terminate the live stream on YouTube that will actually take a minute or two to happen once we do once we press the button, um, and then so the folks on YouTube will no longer see us. But I ask that faculty council members who are in the Zoom meeting stay on stay in the meeting so that we can consider the item of business in closed session. And as soon as we finish our closed session, we'll, we will immediately go back into open session and adjourn. There will be no further business conducted at this meeting after the closed session is over. So. Um, I just wanted to state that for the record. So um, I would invite a motion uh, to go into closed session to consider candidates for honorary degrees. So moved. I take that second uh, uh, um, uh, voice as a second. So uh, without objection, we will now go into closed session. <laughs>